Good morning, everybody. It's uh, Zach with Biosafe. I want to thank you for uh, attending this morning. And uh, we are going to be discussing integrated pest management and sanitation guidelines in cannabis. Uh, the photos from this presentation were taken by me or pulled off of Google. Um, so I wanted to make sure to give credit uh, where credit is due, so to speak. So one of the most important parts of any integrated pest management and uh, you know cleaning protocol is scouting and proper product implementation i.e you need to know what you're dealing with to be able to you know address it effectively there are many different you know pathogens and pests that indoor outdoor and greenhouse growers encounter and so knowing what it is that you're dealing with in uh, addition to where you're dealing with it is going to give you a leg up and make sure that you are able to basically implement chemistries in an effective way so that you're not wasting money and you're actually gaining traction against your issues. Uh, Zach the Grow Guy, who is me, I'm a Colorado slash garden native, uh, basically kind of grew up in the backyard farming with uh, my Sicilian grandfather. We grew a lot of tomatoes and veggies and from a very young age it was instilled in me that uh, you grow what you need yourself. Um, I've been very lucky in how I've been able to work with some of the largest cannabis and hemp producers in the country and uh, basically help them tailor schedules and programs to issues they may be encountering and to make sure that they are doing things productively and uh, proactively rather than reactively and uh, uh, redundantly, I guess you could say. Uh, these are pictures from uh, about a year ago. Uh, the one on the left was an indoor greenhouse in Southern Colorado. The one on the right was an outdoor recreational cannabis grow in uh, the Trinidad area. Uh, I ask anybody uh, that is watching the webinar right now to please take a look at this map. It basically outlines where your reps territories fall. Uh, I myself cover the mountain region for biosafe systems. So that's Oklahoma all the way to Nevada with the exception of Texas and Utah. Uh, my good friend Max Gilly covers California. My good friend Sarah Brockman is Pacific Northwest. Uh, our new uh, and awesome rep, John Kanya, is covering the Great Lakes region. We've got uh, Eric Smith in Texas all the way to Florida. James Atkins covers the uh, south, I guess you could say, with uh, Mike DeRubo picking up the New England area. Uh, if you guys have any questions regarding anything that we've talked about here today after the presentation, please reach out to your regional rep. Uh, for site visits and things like that, and they will be able to accommodate you. So part of teaching somebody something is having them relate to the information that is given. And uh, I personally use Simpsons references all the time, and I think that it's a, a great comparison to what I'm referencing because of the fact that if you can take something that you've learned in a different aspect of your life and relate it to a situation that's occurring now, you're probably going to remember what to do. And so rather than, you know, rattle off active ingredient names or, you know, scientific names for a predatory species of insect or something like that, I try to make it relatable for the grower so that the next time they come into that situation, they can draw on their memory bank, so to speak, and uh, remember the information that they were taught so that they're able to implement you know, a product or procedure effectively. And uh, again, allowing them to do that is you have to make the information personable. There's a big difference between knowledge and experience. If you look at the gentleman on the left side there, he uh, probably spent a buttload of money on all his gear but it's obvious that even though he read every book on how to do it, he's never actually gone out there and done it. He's having a real hard time. 
Whereas you look at the uh, group of people on the right there, they definitely know what they're doing. They've, uh, you know, used their knowledge and gained experience and have been able to, you know, basically maximize the effort that they're putting out because they know what they're doing is efficable. So not to say that knowledge is a bad thing, but knowledge without experience is basically fishing in the ocean and getting smacked in the face. You need to make sure that uh, what you're doing is tried and true. And even if you personally don't have the experience, there's lots of resources out there today for growers to be able to bounce ideas off of one another. And uh, you know the experience is out there. You just have to find a reliable source and uh, you know basically correlate your knowledge to the situation and uh, you know come out on the other side to gain the experience. It's never a mistake if you learn from it. So you know any grower that's afraid to try something new, I understand. But at the same time, cutting down a crop and starting over does not allow you to gain any experience. And if that situation ever arises again, you really don't have a whole lot of previous knowledge or experience to draw through and say, hey, we tried this last time, it didn't work, let's try a different approach. Or last time we implemented X, Y, Z, and it seemed to be effective. So the, the crux between knowledge and experience is what really allows growers to succeed. So IPM, what does that really mean? Obviously it's a moniker, but IPM is a systematic approach to any issues that a grower might face and be able to you know, address and mitigate them before they become full-blown problems rather than just you know, pop-ups. If uh, any grower has told you that they don't have bugs or have never had bugs, um, they need to keep growing a little bit longer because nature is a lot better at this than we are. She's going to find her way in, whether it's a pathogen or a pest pressure situation. And having a game plan is key for anything that you may encounter. Even though it may not ever arise, having something on the books to be able to deal with uh, you know, said scenarios is going to give you a leg up in the beginning because you're not just going to be throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks at that point. I, obviously that stands for integrated. Really growers should use chemistries that complement one another's effectiveness. Uh, for example, using a product like Xeritol, which is something that Biosafe Systems manufactures, and then following up with a biofungicide such as Cease or Serenade is going to exponentially increase the efficable, or the efficacy rather of the Cease or Serenade or double nickel because of the fact that you have basically cleaned the slate before putting down the microbial inhibitor. And so, you know, basically by using them in conjunction, you're gonna get better longevity out of both products and potentially increase your window of application, uh, you know, by three to five days, depending on your environment. Uh, you know, something that a lot of growers will do, um, and it's not necessarily their fault, but they'll use the same mode of action through multiple products because some of the lists have been set up in ways where we're not looking at active ingredients, we may be looking at trade names. And without that knowledge and experience to relate to the grower that there are several companies that may have a similar chemistry, they think that they're alternating you know, modes of action and they may be just developing resistance at that point because of the fact that you know the educational component of it was not there, but I'm, uh, I'm here and my team is here to make sure that, you know, if you guys have any questions about chemistries and how they should be coupled together, tank mixed or, you know, not sprayed, we can provide you some insight on the best way to do it. And that way you're not wasting money, time or crop space. P obviously stands for pest. Pests will find their way in, regardless. You know, like I said, Mother Nature is a lot better at this than we are. If you create a perfect environment for them to be able to grow, minus the, predata the predatory species that would be present in an outdoor environment, and they grow unchecked, certain species of insects can get out of control very quickly. 
Um, the, the top photo there, I'm sure everyone has seen spider mites before. Uh, you know, the second photo is aphids. The third photo being thrip damage. Uh, those seem to be some of the most common pests that indoor growers deal with. They also seem to be some of the most voracious. Um, you know, aphids, for example, have the ability to produce asexually in the spring and summer months. And if we think about what a greenhouse slash warehouse is, it's a per perpetual spring summer, envir summer environment. So we run the risk of, you know, resistance to certain chemical controls. And, uh, you know, they're just generally not a good thing to have in the garden because I've seen you know, basically an adult female give birth to live offspring that was pregnant with eggs. So it, it was almost like a tray hatch had occurred at that point. And, you know, leaving something like that unchecked before you know it, it could be to a point where, you know, you're just in damage control mode and trying to salvage things rather than, you know, being able to hit it on the front end and still harvest a, a good crop. Um, thrips. We're also very voracious because a lot of times people don't realize that they're not just a canopy pest. There is a pupil state of the, you know, western flower thrip that will actually live in the top few inches of the soil. And so when a grower is addressing an issue like that, they need to make sure that they are not only treating the canopy, but they're treating their media as well. Because if we miss that stage of life cycle, they're never going to go away. Um, and then obviously on the right there, we've got some pretty voracious botrytis and powdery mildew. Uh, PM or powdery mildew can pop up overnight. So that one is not necessarily as much of a negligent, you know, pathogen, but with botrytis, you know, when you have big colas and, you know, you're getting towards the end of harvest, part of that scouting and product implementation is looking in the, you know, centers of your colas to make sure that you don't have that anaerobic environment starting to occur and for those pathogens to basically get out of control at that point. So again, one of the biggest components to any spray program is making sure that you are being diligent and targeting the areas that need to be targeted. <clears throat> M obviously stands for management. Uh, again, being a uh, good grower doesn't mean that you won't get bugs. They'll find their way in regardless. You can go to some of the fanciest ornamental nurseries in the United States, and they have a comprehensive integrated pest management program because they understand that certain things find their way in and that, you know, the only thing you can do at that point is address the situation. Um, obviously, a proactive approach is going to give you a much better crop. If you're spraying before you see infestations and you have a schedule of scouting and product implementation, you can harvest top shelf quality stuff and get premium dollar for it. If you get complacent and allow yourself to get into a reactive mode, uh, it's going to be bad on multiple levels. Uh, first and foremost, it's more expensive because if you are treating a situation that's already out of control, it's going to take more chemistry to achieve said level of control. It's also going to degrade the quality of your product if you have to spray multiple times to achieve said level of control. Um, one of the worst things that a grower can tell you is that they've got XYZ, but that it's not that bad. And basically what they're telling you is that they know that they have an issue, but they either don't want to address it or they're not exactly sure how. And so don't let yourself get into a situation where you're saying, oh, we have some mites or we've got a little mildew because holding that door open, so to speak, is going to allow other pests and pathogens to find their way in. You know, if we uh, kind of look at how nature works on multiple levels, you know, a, a lion never hunts a full-grown, happy, healthy gazelle. It always goes after the sick one, the weak one, the old one. And if we're in a situation where we've got weak ones in the herd in a garden, you know, we've just created a disease slash pathogen vector for things to find their way in and have an easy meal. So the, uh, the idea is to mitigate issues before they ever actually become issues. So there's no C in IPM. What gives? There's a, an adage that uh, cleanliness is next to godliness and that an ounce of prevention equals a pound of cure. If you can thoroughly clean your growing environment in between runs, you're gonna 
you know, mitigate the chances of cross contamination from issues that could have occurred from your last run. And, you know, replicating a pest or pathogen problem is detrimental to any operation. So thorough sanitation is key. And, you know, dirty environments breed disease. So if, you know, there are corners that are cut in terms of, you know, post-harvest sanitation and reset, there, the instance of issues replicating themselves go up exponentially. Um, on that picture on the right there, we actually have our biofoamer in action with uh, Sanidate 5 and biofoaming agent. This is a very good way to clean your uh, room, both, uh, you know, if you've got a perpetual environment, it allows you to spot treat and clean exactly where you're trying to. If you do a complete reset of your environment, it ensures that you get the proper contact time on all your vertical surfaces and, you know, the foam is able to penetrate into every nook and cranny that could be there and, uh, you know, basically create an environment, uh, in the case of Sanidate 5, that will meet FDA requirements for food safe. Um, with a no rinse required and a one hour reentry interval, literally you could have a crew go in, take a room down, sanitize it, go to lunch, come back and reset it with a minimal loss of productivity. And as we all know, time equals money. So the fact that there is no rinse required and literally a, a lunch break needs to elapse in between workers coming in and or going out and coming back in, that's, uh, it's kind of a no brainer with the, uh, Sanidate. For sanitation. Uh, these chemistries were specifically approved by the Colorado Department of Agriculture for cannabis. Um, Azagard is the only Azadiractin formulation that is made here in the U.S. Uh, nothing else ever goes through the lines down in the facility, so you never have to worry about cross-contamination or worker exposure to anything that's not on the label. Uh, I'll get into Azagard a little bit more. Uh, all these chemistries I'll, I'll delve into a little bit more further into the presentation, but this is basically just kind of a quick overview. Um, Oxyphos is an awesome one-two punch because it has mono and dipotassium salt of phosphoric acid as well as peroxide. So you're able to elicit what is called an induced systemic response as well as sanitize your canopy in uh, one go. So again, you know, using chemistry with chemistry, it really allows you to get the, you know, maximum bang for your buck. And uh, the really nice thing about Oxyfos is that it has about a 21-day residual within the plant in terms of ISR activity. And so if a grower is able to get on a rotation that basically allows them to treat once in veg, when they flip, week three, week six, assuming a a nine week cycle that next application would actually be a harvest stage and you're able to basically elicit that immunal response from propagation all the way to harvest uh sanidate 5 is our hard surface cleaner so basically tables trays walkways walls you name it sanidate 5 is going to be the go-to it requires a zero rinse but has the ability to give you a food safety claim because on the label it does have human health pathogens such as E. coli, Listeria, Salmonella. And if you can address those pathogens, you've met those FDA requirements. Uh, Xeritol 2.0 is a very similar chemistry to Sanidate 5, but Xeritol is actually designed for plant-based applications. So foliar sprays, root inoculations or disinfections, and uh, water treatment would really be uh, what Xeritol 2.0 is suited for and have growers that will basically apply it on a maintenance interval just to make sure that nothing ever gets out of control. And again, they're using that preventative rather than curative approach. Uh, some of our biostimulants and additives that we also use in the industry uh, would be TerraGrow. Uh, TerraGro is an awesome microbial biostimulant that contains five different bacillus strains, a trichoderma species, as well as kelp and humic acid. And uh, I'll explain a little bit more how those all work together a little bit later. But in terms of microbial inoculants, 
it is really one of the best bang for your buck on the market. Um, Calox is an awesome tool for growers that may not do a lot of transplants and will be growing in, say, like a peat-based media. Uh, a lot of growers will use things like dolomitic lime to, you know, adjust pH over time. But what's really nice about Calox is that it allows a grower to basically have an immediate pH increase for, you know, basically about 30 days. And uh, when used in conjunction with something like dolomitic lime, they're able to get that immediate elicited response as well as that slow release so they can keep the pH in an optimal range for a longer period. Um, and last but not least is our biofoaming agent. Uh, it is necessary to be able to create those soapy suds that we saw on the slide before. Uh, basically, the biofoaming agent is added to the reservoir with the cleaning chemistry. And uh, then that is hooked up to a air compressor and it is applied via a biofoaming uh, applicator. And again, it allows you to get a lot better permeation into nooks and crannies and gives you that vertical surface contact time that is required for proper sanitation. Um, you know, there are a lot of other companies out there that have very effective chemistries that we don't produce. And part of any good integrated pest management program is basically having the key components from each. Uh, you know, some people do things very, very well, and while others have, you know, fortes in different sectors, it's, I always like to use the adage that you're not going to use your electrician to frame your house. You know, use the uh, electrician to do your electrical because that's what he's good at. And so recognizing what some of these other companies make in terms of ethical products is key. You know, BioWorks does a very good job. Certus has some really key products. Marone is on the cutting edge of bioinsecticides, and I do recommend some of their products for certain situations. OHP is trying to get on board. Uh, you know, Green Coast has some good 25B chemistries that complement any IPM rotation. Blacksmith has some really good microbials. Safer. Um, you know, anybody that's been growing for any amount of time can tell you about Safer Soap or Safer Sulfur. Um, MGK are the guys that will produce pyrethrin for 98% of the products that are on the market today. So if you're using a pyrethrin-based product, more than likely that was formulated by MGK. Uh, JH Biotech has some really cool organic uh, options for growers that are trying to mix things up a little bit. And uh, even, you know, a conventional company like Cipro is uh, pushing a microbial insecticide now. So it shows that the biocontrol slash natural organic uh, movement, I guess we could say, is a serious thing in horticulture. And if you're able to replicate, you know, results from chemical chemistries without affecting the environment negatively, I think most growers are going to go to that model as the industry matures because we don't want to, you know, have the EPA or, you know, even the next generation tell us that we destroy the earth by doing what we're doing. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit now about pests, the damage that they cause, and uh, how to treat them. Two-dotted spider mite is uh, a very common pest in indoor cannabis. They really like the hot and uh, you know ample foliage that's provided in an indoor grow. Uh, the most common sign that you're going to have two dotted is uh, like a stippling on the top of the leaves, where it almost looks like it had been sprayed and then magnified um, as the symptoms progress. <coughs> excuse me. Uh, as the symptoms progress, you'll actually see webs start to occur i.e. that's why they call them spider mites but uh, at that point we definitely know that the uh, grower hasn't been doing proper scouting and prop, uh, product implementation if you've got webs because that doesn't happen overnight usually it's you know seven to fourteen days of unchecked growth that they'll get to that point um, on the right here i want to just point out that the gestation period is in between one to three days for most of their cycles and so knowing their molt cycle is going to give you a leg up in terms of your application intervals, because if you can hit them at each stage of life, the odds of them making through it uh, and, or making it through your 
uh, IPM regimen and staying as a, you know, source in the garden go down exponentially. Uh, thrips, we talked about a little bit earlier, but again, they are uh, a voracious pest that seems like it's pretty hard to get rid of for some growers. Uh, the damage typically occurs on the tops of the leaves, and it almost uh, looks like a scarring or a scratch on the top where the chlorophyll has been removed. Um, the thrips typically hang out on the tops of the leaves, and uh, the best thing I can think to compare them to would be like a splinter that you'd get from a board. They're very small, you know, maybe a sixteenth of an inch long, and uh, they typically have a yellowish to brownish appearance to them. And, uh, you know, they are a piercing sucking insect. So if you have thrips in the garden, uh, it's definitely something to address sooner rather than later because of the fact that piercing sucking insects can spread disease. And so if you have a plant that may be infected with a wilt disease such as mosaic or fusarium, and then that thrip moves to another plant, you've just spread said disease. So even though some growers say that they don't cause that much damage, it's the vector effect that really makes them detrimental to any garden. Uh, again, on the right, I've got their life cycle. And so, it, you know, it is possible for a, you know, unchecked thrip population to be alive for, you know, around two months. And so... Having uh, that knowledge, knowing that if you've seen them, you should probably put a implementation uh, in effect for that period of time is only going to allow the grower to be that much more successful. Uh, aphids, both uh, root and canopy aphids are uh, predominantly female in terms of population. Um, when you see them in the canopy, you're typically going to also see something called honeydew which is actually their excrement, and it almost looks like the leaf was uh, dripped on with like sugar water or something. It, it's going to be kind of a shiny appearance, and it almost looks wet on the top of the leaf. So if you're seeing leaves that aren't getting dripped on by HVAC and you haven't sprayed lately that almost look kind of wet or shiny, check your stems, check the undersides of your leaves, because that's a telltale sign that aphids may be present. Um, if we look on the right there, again, in those spring and summer months, they are able to produce asexually. And the reason I bring that up is chemical control can develop resistance. And if mama is resistant to what you're spraying, all her offspring also become resistant. And so, you know, the product rotation is key to make sure that you're still getting efficacy out of what you're spraying, drenching, what have you, and you're not developing said resistance. Root aphids are uh, a pretty big problem because of the fact that uh, they are kind of sight unseen. A lot of growers don't know they have root aphids until the you know symptoms have become severe enough to where it's starting to affect the canopy, and they are at that point in reactive mode rather than proactive mode. Uh, if we look at the picture here on the left, root aphids typically cause uh, something referred into the industry as tacoing. Uh, russet mites and broad mites also cause a form of tacoing, but the main difference between the two is if we look at the picture on the left here, we can see how it's just curling on the periphery. That's a direct result of the root aphids basically slowly taking the osmotic pressure away from the plant by chomping on the roots. So rather than have the you know whole foliage fold in on itself from loss of total osmotic pressure, it's a little bit at a time. Um, and so if you are in a garden and you start to see that situation, the first thing I would do would be to uh, do like an EC slash pH test of the media to make sure that you're not super salty because excess nutrition can also cause this in a VPD deficient atmosphere. But more than likely, if you're seeing this pronounced, you probably have fruit aphid and, uh, Something interesting about them is uh, by the time you see flyers, it's uh, at a point where either the population is such where they're no longer able to feed themselves effectively or they've been exposed to some type of chemical slash predatory control. Um, that's why root aphids are bad flyers. When uh, 
you see them in an environment, they uh, they almost look drunk. Like they'll fly into the lights, they'll fly into the trays, they uh, don't really know where they're going. And that's because that second instar stage where they fly is just an evolutionary adaptation to basically get out of dodge. Um, there are some growers that will ask you, what's the difference between a root aphid and a fungus gnat? And unless you have a super high power scope to be able to tell, it, the easiest ways to differentiate is a fungus gnat is going to have a very defined abdomen and thorax. They almost look like a uh, sleek mosquito, so to speak, whereas an aphid is a lot more bulbous, and uh, they've got something that stick out of their butts called petules. Uh, they're commonly referred to in the industry as tailpipes. Uh, so that's one way to distinguish between the two relatively easily, um, as well as wingspan. You know, a fungus gnat's wingspan is going to be proportional to their body size, whereas an aphid's wingspan is probably gonna be about a third longer than their little uh, stubby bodies. So if you see, uh, you know, basically little round insects, black insects with long wingspans, more than likely you're dealing with root aphids instead of fungus gnats. And, uh, you know, being able to address them with a proper sprench, which is a hybrid of a spray and a drench protocol, is what many growers do to basically eliminate the infestation. Uh, russet mites, we talked about a little bit, but if we look here on the left, we can see that tacoing, how it's much more pronounced, and basically the whole leaf has folded in on itself. Um, also, if we look at that new growth, it's basically come out or coming out completely tacoed with a complete lack of chlorophyll. It's almost yellow instead of green. Um, that is a telltale sign of russet and broads. And uh, the thing that uh, they leave behind before it gets to this situation is it almost looks like brown dust or powdery mildew. So if you're in your garden and you're doing some scouting, you know, slash uh, product implementation, you're looking for hot spots and you see a plant that's got some brown looking dust on it and you know it's not cocoa fiber, um, I would recommend getting like a plastic bag, removing some leaves, and throwing those leaves in the freezer in that bag for about two hours. That way you're going to immobilize any of those pests so that they're not able to boogie on out. Russets don't move quite as fast, but broads have the ability to basically get off that leaf in between when you pluck it and when you get to your scope. And so for scouting for those types of pests, I always recommend basically taking a Ziploc, getting it cold, and then looking at it because that cold is going to slow down their metabolism and it's going to make them a lot easier to spot. Um, if you look on the right there, that's actually a close-up of what russets look like. To me, they kind of resemble maggots, and uh, they are quite gross once you have them. Uh, powdery mildew is kind of, uh, I, I kind of refer to it as like the weed that grows on weeds. Um, it has the ability to basically land on leaf tissue and put down what's called hyphae. And the thing about hyphae is you will not be able to treat it with just a typical surface disinfectant because it gets into the cellular tissue. And so that's where something like oxyfos that allows the plant's own defense system to really kind of kick into gear and mitigate pathogens comes into play. Because if we look at that photo on the left there, we can see where it's sporulating. But if we look on the you know leaf tissue itself, all those uh, lines or uh, they almost look like calm cable that's running across the, the surface of the leaf is the hyphae. And so we can treat where it's sporulating, but if we don't get rid of that hyphae, it's like a dandelion in terms of how each time it comes back, it's going to be more voracious, you know, harder to get rid of. And uh, it basically, by not getting rid of the root system, so to speak, each time it's going to be a little bit stronger that it reappears. Um, the other thing about powdery mildew is that it compromises your plant's immune system. And so a lot of times you'll see a plant that has powdery and spider mites or powdery and thrips or powdery and then botrytis. Because of the fact that the plant's immune system is already compromised, again, to go to that analogy about lions and gazelles, you've created the weak one in the herd. And so nature is going to try to eliminate it with all the ammunition that she can bring. And so, you know, basically identifying this stuff early and treating it effectively is going to allow you to have much less instance of crop loss 
and you know, for, or curative rather than preventative. Uh, botrytis is a huge problem for warehouse growers, especially in the fall and winter months because of the uh, ice water glass theory. You know, you've got a cold glass ice water on a hot day. What does it do? Sweat. Well, if you've got a hot warehouse on a cold day, what's it going to do? It's going to sweat. And that increase in humidity, um, this is when we typically see botrytis at its worst. Uh, the worst part about this pathogen is that it typically doesn't occur until the final stages of growth, you know, week six, week seven, week eight of flower. And uh, basically it needs high humidity and low air flow to be able to propagate itself effectively. Um, a lot of growers that have experienced botrytis problems have been able to remedy it with a uh, application of Xeritol at a one to 100 rate mixed with a non-ionic surfactant, such as cocoa wet or natural wet, and then implementing, uh, I know it sounds silly, but those old tongue depressor style popsicle sticks that you can get at Hobby Lobby, if you can break it at a 45 and actually pull the affected cola open and stick that 45 angle into that uh, <clears throat> part of the bud where the stem and cola basically have come apart, to increase that airflow, you're gonna see much less instance of botrytis reoccurring. And uh, with microbial testing being a real thing, it would uh, be very unfortunate for growers to get to the final stage and then fail because of something like this. So there are strains that are susceptible to it, but we definitely have options to be able to take care of it. Um, Pythium and Fusarium are a couple of the most common root-borne pathogens that cannabis encounters. Uh, Pythium is basically a root borne disease that happens when there is stagnicity in the water or an abundance of organics. Um, basically, it, it makes your roots kind of slimy and brown. The nice thing about Pythium is that you can actually treat it effectively and harvest the crop and that it's not going to be something that will stick around exponentially like uh, the next thing I'm going to talk about, Fusarium. Uh, Fusarium is a wilt disease that uh, unfortunately, once a plant has become infected, we can mitigate the symptoms, but there's nothing we can do in terms of elimination other than possibly tissue culturing it out of said cultivar. Um, so in the instance of something like Fusarium, preventative is way better than curative because you're never gonna get rid of it. You can put a Band-Aid on the bullet wound, but it's never gonna completely fix it. So you know, doing a water treatment protocol and uh, you know, putting in beneficial biology to help be antagonistic towards certain pathogens allows growers to mitigate issues before they ever become problems. Um, this is the section, guys, where I'm gonna get into each one of the products a little bit more in depth. Uh, Azagard, uh, as I mentioned earlier, is the only azadiractin that's actually formulated here in the United States. Uh, the reason that this is a key component for any integrated pest management program is Azagard does three really key things for you. First and foremost, it's an anti-feed. And so when you treat an insect population with Azagard, if they're not able to eat as much as they want, they're gonna be weaker and more susceptible to whatever follow-up contact or you know microbial kill that you're going to use. And if you can kick them while they're down, so to speak, you're gonna have much better results out of your products. There are some growers that will tank mix azadiractin with a knockdown, such as pyrethrin. Uh, I personally do not like this approach because of the fact that you want to be able to gain the benefits from the azadiractin product in terms of if you kill it before it is not able to be weakened by not eating. That's where we run into you know situations where certain individuals might be more resistant to a chemistry. And so by allowing the anti feed and quality to kick in, you know, you spray as a direct and on Monday, you wait until Wednesday and to uh, basically do your uh, your heavy hitter, you're going to see much better results out of it. Um, that being said, even though as a direct and is systemic, if you are relying on ingestion as the only mode of exposure, your efficacy goes way down because insects don't want to eat once they've been treated. And so you want to make sure that you're coming in contact with your target population. If it's the canopy pest, it's 
spray the canopy. If it's root aphids, you know, do a sprench. Make sure that that chemistry is coming in contact with the insect so that you get that efficacy. Um, it's also an oviside. So when it comes in contact with an adult female, uh, I'll just use spider mites for example. Let's say she lays 10 eggs. If only two are viable, then you've just reduced that next week's population by 80% which again is going to allow you to use your other controls to achieve a much quicker level of success. Uh, the other really key component is that it's an IGR or growth regulant. If you're able to basically stop an insect's ability to molt effectively and it can't go from a larva to nymph to an instar stage smoothly, you're reducing the amount of viable adults that can reproduce. And so without, you know, viable eggs and without a viable adult population you're controlling those insects without really ever having to kill them and that's where you know as a guard really comes into play is it's like the jab and the one-two punch you weaken them you mess with their ability to live a happy healthy life and then they're easier to come in and knock out with some of the other products that are available to some of the growers um, oxyphos Again, it's uh, kind of the one-two punch when it comes to certain pathogen sanitation. Uh, the peroxidal component, when it comes in contact with leaf tissue, is going to sterilize any mycelium or anything that could be there that's going to sporulate and procreate. Um, and then those induced systemic response benefits, it's almost like giving your plant a flu shot and so that it uses its own defense system to get rid of those hyphae that could be left behind from something like powdery mildew so that it's not able to come back each time. Uh, again, the uh, interval is about 21 days. So having a three-week spray schedule with OxyFoss allows a grower to basically put it out as needed without sacrificing, you know, or efficacy. Um, the other really cool thing about potassium phosphite or mono and dipotassium salt of phosphoric acid is that it is systemic. So in a situation where you may have decent level pathogen control going on and you don't want to get your calyxes wet, let's say week six, there's actually a chemigation application of oxyphos that you could do and basically still elicit that response without getting your you know, flowers wet, integrating your potency that way. Um, there are some other products on the market that are known as SARs, which stand for Systemic Acquired Resistance Products. And if we were to compare the two on a bell curve, an ISR, it's elicited immediately, but it tapers off a lot quicker, whereas an SAR takes a much longer time to get to that optimal level, but it sticks in the plant for a longer period of time. Um, I've had many growers that will actually tank mix regalia from Marone with Oxyfos to basically get that one-two punch where they're getting an ISR and an SAR response. And basically, you know, using two different channels within the plant to trigger their uh, maximum immunity, so to speak. Uh, TerraGrow is our biostimulant. Uh, it has five different strains of bacillus, as well as the kelp and humic acid component. Uh, I really like the fact that we have added the bacillus lycoformis in Magitarium because they are known for nitrate reduction and phosphate fixation. So they're basically going to allow you to push your base nutrients that much further. You couple those species with humic acid and uh, you've basically enhanced your unsoluble nutritional factor exponentially. Um, we also add trichoderma in there, which uh, helps keep things happy, healthy, and clean. The uh, kelp, component is also key to any grower because if you are able to give the auto or uh, auxins, cytokinins, and gibberlians from a, uh, you know, acify and nidosum, which is the North Atlantic sea kelp, to a plant that's in an optimal environment, you can increase that growth exponentially. If we think about where kelp grows, you know, it's in the bottom of a deep, dark, cold ocean, but it's green. So that tells us that it still photosynthesizes. And so by giving all those components from kelp to a plant that's got optimal nutrition, perfect environment, and plenty of light, uh, those plants are able to basically grow better than they would be able to without that component. Um, also, the thing with TerraGrow is uh, the price point versus a lot of the other microbial inoculants that are on the market. Um, 
basically you're going to be running anywhere from half to one gram per gallon, depending on your media for a re-inoculation rate. Um, it's anywhere from one to one and a half pounds per acre for an outdoor application. But here in Denver, a four pound container retails for about 80 bucks. So, you know, $20 an acre to be able to treat plants is a awesome price point versus some of the other inoculants out there that are several hundred dollars for a couple pounds. Our Sanidate 5.0, I talked about a little bit earlier, but basically it is our hard surface cleaner. Um, I really believe that it is the crux of safety versus efficacy in terms of how it breaks down into oxygen and water, uh, the requirements for PPE versus some of the other gnarly or sanitizers that are out there. Um, again, you're able to create a food safe environment with Sanidate with a zero rinse and one hour REI. Um, it is a superior product to something that needs to be rinsed off because let's say, for example, you may have a dirty water column and, you know, your trays may have some scuffs in them or, you know, microbial sinks where certain things could adhere and be able to propagate. If you have to sanitize, but then you rinse with dirty water, why even sanitize at that point? Because you just re-inoculated the environment. And so that, that zero rinse really allows people to start clean and stay clean. Uh, last but not least, Xerotol 2.0 is going to be basically everything for plant-based applications. So, you know, spraying your clones, dunking your clones before you stick them in your rooting hormone, uh, weekly foliar sprays to ensure that the canopy doesn't have any negative microbial growth, um, all the way to, you know, dosing it out with like a D14 MZ3000 from Dosatron uh, with CalRes or Viton seals to be able to address like what I was talking about with the Sanidate in terms of you can clean your water column so you never have to worry about things like, you know, pythium, zoospore, cyanobacteria, filamentous algae being present in your lines. And by utilizing, you know, the Xeritol in a constant injection situation, you're going to keep your environment much cleaner and uh, actually be putting a little bit of DO or dissolved oxygen into the root zone. Um, the really cool thing about the five to seven ppm rate which is what we shoot for for water treatment is it's mostly going to be used up in your manifolds and lines and so you don't have to worry about like you know for example negatively affecting terragro that you just inoculated with because the sanitizer is basically going to do its job in the system and by the time it gets to the actual spray stake and onto the pot the amount that's there is negligible, so you're not going to have detrimental effects on microbial populations that are already established in your media. Uh, thank you guys for listening. I look forward to seeing you all succeed. Uh, this is a picture of my good friend Leland, who works for Front Row, one of the best growers in Colorado. Uh, his name's Willie Gardner, and myself down at Montefiore about a last, uh, I want to say it was about a year ago. But, uh, you know, I, I like to keep a, a close knit group of guys that we work with. And, you know, it's one of those things that the more you get to know your rep, the better level you guys will all be on. And, you know, those Saturday phone calls won't seem like a chore or what have you when they pop up. But uh, I really appreciate everybody listening. And uh, hopefully you were all able to gain some insight and knowledge out of this. Um, I guess I'll leave it open if there are any questions. Hey, I just wanted to jump in. Uh, thanks so much for that very informative presentation, Zach. Uh, this is Patrick Williams. I'm Senior Editor of Greenhouse Management. I'll be asking a few questions on behalf of the audience. Uh, just wanted to let everyone know that uh, if you have any questions, you can use the questions box to your right on your screen to enter your question, and we'll address those here in a few minutes. Um, Zach, a few questions came in so far. Um, so I was just hoping to ask you, um, one of our audience members was curious about PAA or peroxyacetic acid, uh, which is in mm -hmm. Sanidate 5.0 and Xerotol 2.0. Can you just expand a little bit on what PAA is and or what it does? So peroxyacetic acid is basically glacial grade acetic acid or very pure vinegar that has been stabilized in solution with peroxide. And the reason that we add 
peroxyacetic acid to our regular hydrogen peroxidal based chemistries is when someone uses regular H2O2 and they mix it up and they start to see that bubbling action occur, that's basically their ORP or oxidation reduction potential going down. And so the thing with conventional H2O2 is the degradation of it is almost immediate and exponentially uh, more so in terms of like if it takes a grower, you know, two hours to spray down a room that they are trying to sanitize, you know, five minutes in, they probably have a decent level of sanitation going on. But, you know, if it's a hot room and, you know, the water isn't necessarily the cleanest, for example, like if they use tap water that's, you know, dirty, they might be spraying plain water or pathogen on the end of the, you know, spray cycle because of the fact that that degradation occurs. The cool thing about PAA is that really it only breaks down when it comes in contact with the pathogen. And so if it takes that grower two hours to spray that room, he can be confident. About five minutes in, one hour in, two hours in, he's going to have that comparable level of sanitation occurring. Thanks for that. Um, on kind of a similar topic, someone asked, can Sanidate be used in place of Xerithal? Um, for water treatment, if they are doing more than 6,000 gallons a day, we can use an Editron injector to basically get them at a rate of about one to 10,000 so that they're able to clean the water column. But uh, really, the Sanidate is more designed for hard surfaces because the 5% uh, PAA doesn't necessarily play well with certain varietals, where we found that that 2% PAA is kind of the, the crux of efficacy versus detriment in terms of most varieties can take a two percent and still have a a good result from the spray without you know burning the foliage whereas a five percent paa on certain varieties can cause phytotoxicity someone asked someone else asked uh can you comment on fogging xerotol or sanidate uh for sanitation versus foaming um the fogging is a, a good way to do it as well um the only reason I like foaming is because of the fact that you're going to get better cling on your vertical surfaces. If we think about, you know, water droplets on a wall, like if you were to go up and just spray it with a spray bottle, for example, it's going to beat up and run right down. And even though fogging is a smaller particulate, it's still going to do the same basic, you know, action in terms of accumulation, you know, beating up and then running down. With, uh, you know, the Sanidate, the, the key component is contact time. And so by putting that foam there and giving it the cling, they, uh, they are able to ensure that they've sanitized the environment effectively and use less chemistry to do it because if they have to fog the environment twice to get that contact, well, then they just mixed up two reservoirs and spent double the amount of money they normally would have. Someone asked if you can repeat the use of Sanidate in the cleaning water supply. They said they collect hundreds of gallons of water in the warehouse daily, but have a problem with keeping growth out. Uh, for a water treatment rate, they would basically want to be at a ratio of 1 to 7,000 on the high end to 1 to 10,000 on the low end. And they are able to achieve that through a Editron peristaltic injector that basically has a flow paddle that they put on their uh, you know, outline, so to speak. And uh, it's able to basically communicate with that uh, injector and say, you know, okay, we've had, you know, let's say 10,000 gallons come through, so we need to do one part of solution or what have you. Um, and so it's able to automate itself and basically inject as needed. Um, at that point, what we typically recommend is that the grower gets what are called Lamotte PAA test strips and then to go to one of their emitters in one of the gardens and basically test what's coming out of that emitter to make sure that they have the proper level of PAA present in the line. So someone asked, uh, what's the best way to treat root aphids, would you say? Um, if they could send me an email, it's, it's a very involved process and it has multiple steps. I would be more than happy to put together a program for them, but it, it's uh, not something I can just rattle off real quick. There's probably 11 different steps, and so I want to make sure that they've got all the information. 
Great. And I think that's a good lead in to uh, just mention that um, if anyone has any further questions, they can reach out to Zach directly. Um, we will be posting uh, this webinar uh, on our website and sending out an email to the audience. So uh, that will contain Zach's contact information as well. Um, so yeah, look out for that email here in the next few weeks that should uh, go out in the new year. Uh, we'd also like to mention that our sister publication, Cannabis Business Times, will provide education about cannabis and hemp production at its 2020 Cannabis Conference, and that's taking place April 21st through 23rd, 2020, in Las Vegas, um, specific to the topic of pest control, ethnobotanist Robert C. Clark will present on cannabis critters from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. on the 23rd. Uh, early bird registration for the Cannabis Conference expires next Friday. December 27th, when prices will increase by $100. Um, again, uh, we'll be sending out an email to everyone who attended, uh, and we will also have the webinar on our site here pretty soon. Um, so yeah, that wraps it up for today. We'd like to thank you, Zach, uh, as well as our audience once again, and hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody, for listening, and uh, I'm sure we'll all talk soon. <laughs>